Running a Pokemon card business in 2023, is it a good idea? What are some challenges? What is it really like in real life? And we're going to talk about just kind of random stuff too. I don't make a lot of long form content because I hate editing, but I realize that, hey, I don't need to edit. You guys just want to hear my beautiful voice. And I personally love long form content when I'm working and listening to it in the background. So we're just going to ramble here. So what is the current state of my business now that it's 2023? We're in a bear market. Um, which basically means there's not a whole lot of faith in the product. Uh, there's no more uh, free attendees, as they say, where you can go out, buy a booster box, and flip that sucker for like an extra 20, 30, 40%. Um, items are selling for way less than they used to. MSRP on booster boxes is like 160 bucks, and pretty much all of the current ones are selling for like 110 or lower. Some of them, uh, I think. Paldea Evolved and like Scarlet and Violet Base are selling for like warehouse price, which is about $95. So not really a great time to be in the business. Or is it? Ooh, cliffhanger. So um, a little bit about me in case you guys didn't see my, uh, my mastermind video, which go check it out. I go like an hour about how to start a business. Um, we started with Japanese stuff. And we did that because in 2021, when we started, we were going through the whole craziness. Uh, people were basically going into Walmart by the drove and, and buying all the stuff off the shelf and flipping it on eBay. And so like the average Pokemon fan didn't have access to the stuff. And so I'm like, oh, I could find some people in Japan and basically import it and then provide that um, as kind of a, uh, hey, you can't read the card, but if you like to collect the pretty pictures, here you go. That was the idea. And it really took off. And now Japanese is like very much more mainstream. Everything's way too expensive now. The Japanese market's crazy high. And the English market is ironically somehow, somehow an English booster box is selling for less than the average Japanese booster box. And a Japanese booster box MSRP is like 40 bucks compared to an American booster box at 160. So we're, it's a very interesting time. Uh, since then, we've adopted Korean and Indonesian products. Indonesian doesn't sell very well, but Korean, especially EV Heroes, is huge. And I think that's going to be like the first lesson we talk about. And I think I mentioned it in the mastermind. Um, diversity is key. The English market, it's hard to make money right now for store owners. But the Japanese market, um, it, it's a little easier. The Korean market, it's very easy to make money if you've got the right connection. So while we have a ton of product just laying around in our warehouse area, we are still making a lot of sales because we've diversified successfully. And I'm not saying you guys have to go out and get, you know, five different languages of Pokemon cards because, quite frankly, you won't be able to uh, very easily. It takes a lot of effort. But also, it's not like the only way to do business. So what is it really like running a Pokemon card business? Um... I don't have a brick and mortar. That's a very, very different beast. I run an online store out of my basement. And in some ways that's easier. And in most ways it's easier. In some ways it's harder. So number one, let's get the romanticization. Ro romantic. Let's stop romanticizing this life. It's not a fun job. I like it. It's a good job. I make lots of money. I don't have to deal with like a boss or uh, employees or coworkers. Like I like to be alone. I'm an extremely like introverted person, like like at an unhealthy level, and I don't really like to be around people for more than a, a couple hours a day. And uh, so I like the job, but it's not fun. There's nothing fun about running a Pokemon card business, at least an online business. Uh, my day basically consists of. You know, I, I wake up whenever I want, which is great. There are good perks, and we're going to talk about those. But fun, by fun, I mean thrilling. There's nothing thrilling about it. I wake up, I go downstairs, I uh, check out my orders that I got the night prior or, or in the morning, and uh, I package things for a few hours. You know, I take it off the shelf, go to my packing station, I box it up, I print a label, and I put it in a pile and then USPS drives up, um, which is another perk, by the way. I don't have to go anywhere. USPS comes to the house, I hand it over, and then they drive away. And that's, like, the main thing in the business. That's what, you know, keeps the money flowing. Now, of course, there's a gajillion other elements. Um, marketing, I have to do, like, email campaigns where I, you know, pick some items to feature, whether they're, like, pre-order items like English 151 
or uh, maybe items that are really hot or items we have on sale or items that are not hot that I'm like, hey, don't forget guys, we have these too. So email marketing is huge. I do a lot of like Instagram marketing. I make videos, not as many as I'd like to, but uh, I'm trying to you know stay relatively consistent. So that stuff's like fun. I mean, I, I like the limelight. It's fun to get like, you know, that dopamine rush when people watch your video and comment and like it or dislike it. Um, I'm not, I'm not trying to like pity myself. This is obviously a fan freaking tastic job, but there's a lot of people out there. And, uh, if you watch Rudy from Alpha Investments, he does mostly Magic the Gathering stuff, but Pokemon too. He'll tell you straight up, he's like, there's a lot of people that really romanticize this idea of running a Pokemon card business. And, uh, it's not that fun. Um, in the beginning it is, uh, when I was like, I'm, I'm too big now. Uh, and I just say that to be objectively honest, I, like I'm too big to do the things that I used to do that were not thrilling, but more fun. Like I used to stream three days a week. I got to engage with the community, um, stay up late, open cards, see the art. It was just fun. You know, being a streamer, it's fun. Uh, you get a dopamine kick from it. You listen to music, a lot of anime music. That was fun. And now I'm too big to do that. And it, it seems like a, like, what, what do they always say? Uh, that's a good problem to have. And it is financially. I mean, I'm like, but, and a lot of people don't understand, like, Brian, what do you mean you don't have time for it? Well, for some perspective, when I was streaming regularly, like three times a week, we were doing, you know, $80,000 in sales per month. So every day we'd, we'd package up between like two and three grand of stuff, which doesn't take very long. At the time I thought it did, but looking back, I'm like, oh, what was I worried about? Now, so then when I started kind of like, oh, I'll stream twice a week or here and there, then we were doing like 110, 150,000 in sales per month. Now we're doing between 350 and 450 in sales per month, uh, depending on the sets that release. Like when Japanese 151 came out, we did 450K. Now we're kind of in a lull. We're doing like 375. Once the English 151 comes out, we'll probably do uh, 500,000 K, $500,000 in a month, which by the way, if you're relatively new to this business, that those numbers are baffling. Like I'm not immune to how stupidly crazy that is. I'm not going to act like, oh, I have make so much money. These numbers are e like, it's bananas. Trust me. I know it's, it's bananas. But you can see why I don't have a lot of time to do like streaming too. Um, and for the record, when people say they don't have time to do things, they're lying. That you can make time to do anything. I could make time to stream, but what was happening is once we hit that 150k a month, I was like, I had to choose between like friends and health and sleep, health and, and streaming. And I'm a I'm like a petite person. I weigh right now. I weigh 150 pounds. And that's kind of been like my weight since high school, up and down slightly, but like pretty damn consistent. Well, when I was streaming three days a week and super busy, um, I got down to like 137. Like I lost like 10, 15 pounds. And it's like when you're this, you know, relatively small, um, that's a lot of weight. I mean, that's a good percentage. That's an unhealthy percentage of weight. And it's because I wasn't eating properly. I couldn't go to the gym, so I, I lost all my muscle tone. And I wasn't sleeping. So that kind of like, that's not good. And I'd forget to eat meals, period, or I wouldn't have time to eat them because I'd be focusing on streaming. And then uh, also like streaming, like you're streaming for like eight hours a night, six to eight hours a night. And then you have to pack the orders and packing a booster box is super easy. You throw it in a box, you put a thing of bubble wrap on it, you mail it. Packing rip and ship orders when you're streaming, that takes a lot more time because they're loose cards. You have to protect them, top load them. It, it's a lot more effort. So that's one of the fun things that I had to give up, which, you know, I, it, it sucks. It, it's one of those things that sucks. And then another fun thing I gave up was uh, like doing pop-up shops. Uh, we have a mall here in Omaha. It's Cholesterol's Mall. Uh, and we, every like weekend they would do like, you could come in as a local business, pay 400 bucks and then have like a pop-up shop. And I did that um, pretty much every weekend of the summer. This was last year, two years ago. I don't know. It was, re you know, it was a summer and that was fun. Cause I got to meet, uh, folks in the community, whether they're Pokemon people or just people like, kind of like curious, like, Oh, you sell Pokemon cards. What's that like? 
it was fun. It's fun engaging with people. Um, I'm very introverted, but I have my moments where I'm like, oh, people are fun. And so that was cool. It was different. I, I lived the brick and mortar life without any of the risk. And we'll get into that. There's a lot of risk with brick and mortar. And I'm probably only, and I'm probably only aware of half of the risks since I, I don't do that, but there's no risk really. Um, you get to engage with people, uh, you hand out your business cards, you can build a, a bigger customer base. Well, I don't get to do that anymore either for all the reasons that we've already discussed. So that's another fun thing that got kind of left behind. Um, you become very immune to the thrill of having all the product. A lot of people ask, you know, Ooh, aren't you tempted to open everything? And, uh, I'm a minimalist. I don't really buy anything. So like the temptation was usually never really there, but I still thought it was cool. Like I'd look at my, all my crazy shelves and I'd be like, wow, look at all these Pokemon cards. And now I'm completely immune to it. I mean, it's like, uh, it's like having a lamp in your living room or a nightstand in your bedroom. Like it, it's just another thing in my house. Like they're just they just exist, and I, I take them, and I put them in boxes, and I ship them away, and then more come in, and that was another, like, it was thrilling when I got my first pallet, like, that's such a milestone when you're a store, an online store, a brick, whatever, and you get a pallet of stuff, like, a pallet weighs, like, a thousand pounds, that's insane, and the first time it happened, I made, like, TikTok videos, and it was all, like, oh, wow, what a thrill, now it's just kind of a nuisance, like, I get the pallet, and I'm, like, Ugh. so now I'm in a basement, um, I lived in a split entry uh, a few months ago. I moved to a ranch because I needed the space. But like now it's like, oh, this is annoying. So I have to carry everything down one by one. You really get immune to it. Um, it sounds like I'm complaining, but I'm just being honest. Like, and I'm not complaining. I, I, I love like this is a fantastic job for me and I love it and I'm very thankful for it. But for the people that romanticize the idea, it's it's not a fun job. Now, brick and mortar, uh, my good friend Devin, he is, uh, he owns a brick and mortar store in Benson, which is just North Omaha. And just like me, he's a business guy. Uh, he runs, he has like a DJ operation, makes a lot of money doing like weddings and events. But he also owns this brick and mortar and he has employees, so he's not there all the time. But he likes to engage with this community. He does like every Wednesday, there's a, there's a trade night. Uh, people come, they really like him. He's very charismatic. He is an extrovert. He loves people and it looks fun, but uh, while more thrilling than my life here alone in my basement, his life comes with more risk. You've got to make rent. You've got to, you're in charge of employees, which that alone sucks. I've been on a team before. I know how that is. You also are kind of responsible for the employee's well-being. You know, you've got to pay uh, these people's paycheck every two weeks, and you you know it's like you can't you can't put all their problems on you. Like if they're having financial difficulties, like you got to take care of yourself first, of course. But when you get someone to quit their old job and move to your job, like you are somewhat responsible for their well-being, at least on some level, or you'd at least feel somewhat responsible. So he's got to take care of these people. He's got to take care of rent, um, you know, utilities that are his responsibility. Theft, you're a lot more likely to get robbed or stolen from when you have a brick and mortar. I'm in a residential property. Uh, no one really knows where I live. There's a few people that do, but like, for the most part, like the chance of my house getting broken into is the same as any house getting broken into. I'm in a nice part of town. It's unlikely. His life, uh, or his, his store, you know, it could get broken into. There's a lot, a lot of extra stuff when you're a brick and mortar. And a lot of you guys that watch this, like, that's kind of what you uh, dream of doing. You know, you want to do the brick and mortar life. Just be aware of the costs that come with that. To put like a, you're going to need a professional sign for the front facade of your building. That can be like $5,000 to create and hang. You're going to need a really good insurance. That could be between $200 and $300, depending on your inventory a month. Uh, you're going to need inventory. You know, if you have a store, you want to carry probably $40,000 of inventory um, to keep your shelves, you know, full maybe 25,000 at minimum. And then you've got employees to pay. Let's say you hire one employee, they're working 40 hours a week, you pay them, you know, $15 an hour. Okay, well, that's, uh, you know, I don't know, like 20, uh, 2100 a month or something. You've got um, shelves and cases and 
uh, some sort of cash sharing system. You've got all this stuff, tables, chairs, all the stuff that you wouldn't even think of. Paint, carpet, uh, flooring, all this stuff. And also, your um, I didn't know this at the time, but when you rent a building, when you lease a building for your company, at least here in Omaha, there's no such thing as like, oh, one year and then like like you go to Planet Fitness, it's like, oh, no, uh, you know, no contract. I thought you could rent like a lease of space for like one year at a time, which that way, if your business went to hell, you only have to pay for a month and then you're, you're Gucci. That's not the case here in Omaha. Um, basically, if you want a nice property, like in the West Side, which is where I'm at, you're paying like for five years, like you you sign a contract for five years. And if your business goes to hell, you can get out of that lease for a very hefty fee, maybe, maybe. Or you have to like sublease that out to somebody else, or you have to just keep paying it and not even occupy it. There's a lot of risk involved. And it just goes back to that R word again, risk, risk, risk. So for the people that romanticize a brick and mortar, that's going to, I mean, you're going to probably want in this economy between, I don't even know, all the, all the stuff I already said, and then maybe 50K in cash, liquid, um, because you're going to need to take on more inventory and blah, 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 and just kind of as a cushion. So that's a hard one to get into. If you're watching this, that might be your dream, but the most uh, realistic possibility of getting into the business is an online store, which is, again, what I do. So what are some risks online? Well, again, we already discussed it's not fun. It's not a thrilling job, but there are risks too. Chargeback scams, um, obviously more money, more problems. So if I'm selling you know, $400,000 a month, uh, it seems like every month there's some sort of fraud or, or lost packages or stolen packages, which has happened from um, postal carriers, EPS mostly, and FedEx. You know, lost packages that aren't insured, stolen, um, people that scam you, credit card fraud. Like, that's going to be, you know, between 1000 and 2500 per month. This, like, is pretty regular. And if you're like, oh, my God, I can't afford that. Well, if you're doing 10 times less business than me, say you're doing you know, 40000 a month in, in sales, well, you can divide that $1,000 a month by 10 and then say, okay, you lose 100 bucks or 200 bucks a month due to fraud and theft. So like all the numbers I'm giving you just divide by 10 or 20, however uh, small your business is at the start. So that sucks. Um, also, we bought like a really big house, um, not because like I'm a minimalist. Again, I didn't buy this big fancy house because I was like, ooh, I make money now. I'm cool. No, I bought it because it has a big ass basement and uh, basically our mortgage went up a thousand dollars. Like our old house, it was, uh, I'm in Nebraska, so real estate's really cheap here. The old house, I was paying 1500 a month mortgage and this house we're paying 2600. So big jump, but that $1,000 premium is nothing compared to if I leased a building where I'm not building equity and I'm also, you know, locked in too. So it made sense. But you know, if the business goes to hell, I have this bigger house I need to pay for, you know, could, could I afford it if everything goes to, goes to hell? I don't know. So there's that risk. Um, the risk of failure, people don't like to fail. They, uh, you might make social media, you get like kind of that hype and then you fail, uh, and then your ego takes a hit. That's a risk. Over leveraged. If you start a business such as this one, it's very, very easy to get over leveraged. Credit card debt, I always say it's a free loan for 30 days or, or longer, depending on how you strategize, you have an interest-free loan. That can be very dangerous for some people. I am a huge fan of credit card debt because I pay it off every month. If I have a set coming out where I might not have the capital or I don't want to use the capital, I can lay down, I've, I, I think at most I lay down 50K of credit card debt, buy all the stuff up front, and then sell it all and then pay off that 50K before the, uh, the balance is due. Some people, they don't have that self-control, they don't have that organization, or they might not have the skill to get rid of items before that bill is due. So credit card debt, that's a huge risk to a business. Uh, you get over leveraged in debt, you could really F yourself. Over leveraged in product, you know, when I started, English product was as good as gold. You could buy it, I, I couldn't buy enough. My distributor wouldn't even have enough for me. So I would buy as much as I could. I'd sell it really quickly. And then I'd be like, well, shit, I don't have any product now. Well, now 
it's a very different market, but I still had that mindset of buy as much as you can. So I ordered uh, I think 600 boxes of Scarlet Violet Base. I ordered 650 boxes of Paldea Evolved, uh, 780 boxes of Obsidian Flames. And as you can imagine, those aren't selling very quickly. I could fire sell them. I could sell them at, at cost, but I don't want to do that because I have the capital laying around where I don't need the money back. But you can imagine someone who doesn't have a lot of cash on them that orders all this stuff from their distro and then they're screwed. They have to pay this huge invoice. Like my invoice was like 150K. If I couldn't pay that, uh, you can imagine the repercussions. I, you know, either they don't send the product and then I'm kind of blacklisted because like, oh, he doesn't have money. He can't pay off his invoices. We're not sending stuff to him. Or they already sent it and I truly owe them money and now I'm in debt. And I don't know what happens when you are when you owe a company that much money and you don't have it. I have no idea. It goes to collections, you go bankrupt. I don't know. Scary. So those are the things that you can kind of come to expect. Um, every day is stressful. Every day. Like, we're selling a lot. We're selling, you know, 400, 450K a month now, which sounds like, wow, Brian, it's bringing in the millions. But... Our profit margins, because a lot of that's English, and our margins are so much lower than they used to be. Japanese stuff, it's super expensive. Um, you know, 100 bucks a booster box for some of it, but I'm not paying MSRP. If I sell a box of 151 Japanese for 160 bucks, I'm not getting it for 40. I'm getting it for like $142. Like I'm making 15 bucks, 20 bucks on a box, and then you gotta take away the 2.3% credit card fee. Sometimes I take an L on shipping. It just kind of depends. Taxes are things. Taxes are really rough. So in the end, you know, after that, you're making maybe 11 bucks a booster box. I'm selling several hundred booster boxes, so it does add up. But it's not like buco bucks. Like, And then plus, I'm working 80 hours a week sometimes, sometimes 100 hours a week. And sometimes it's chill. Sometimes not very many hours. Like, this is kind of a chill month. But, um... I don't know where I was going with that, but it's, oh, the stressful, it's, it's a stressful world. So it's like, if I don't make enough profit in a month, uh, it's stressful every day, every day, I feel like the business could go away. And that's not a rational fear. Um, Rudy from Alpha Investments always says, you know, 90% of uh, fears don't, don't come true. I don't know where he got that number, but like, that seems reasonable. Uh, so it's not a rational fear. Like, like we've got enough in savings. We have enough in product. I did it really well, and I'm, I'm really happy that I just did it all right, um, thank God. But uh, yeah, every day, I still irrationally fear that the business can go to zero and I lose everything I've built. I fear uh, the house could start on fire. I have insurance, but like, I fear everything burning, like on fire. Uh, my neighbor's house burned down, my old house, so that, that was great for mental health. Uh, floods. I fear water damage. It, it rains here. We have tornadoes here. Uh, I've, I've, like these are things that as a business owner, even if they're irrational or very unlikely every day you wake up. And at some point during that day, you, this stuff creeps into your mind, not all the time, but at some point during the day, this happens. Uh, the, the fear of a set crashing, maybe you, you go hard in Paldea evolved like I did thinking that you're not going to get MSRP, you're not getting 160 a box, but maybe I'm like, oh, we'll probably get 120 bucks a box. Well, now they're selling for like 95. If I had all my money tied up in that, I mean, shh, I'd be screwed. That's another, it's everything, everything. If you start a business in, in Pokemon or anything else, you are going to be stressed out all the time. And if you're not stressed out all the time, you're probably not taking the right amount of risks to grow that business to a level where you'll be proud of. Like the stress and the fear, it's uh, it's a sign of growth where you're pushing yourself to the limits all the time. And you have to decide if that's something you want to take on. I'm already mentally ill, like diagnosed, like I'm, I, I have, <laughs> I have disorders and I'm medicated for it, but this stuff is not helping. Like at all. This stuff does not, like, you, I need to be probably medicated for two other disorders. You know, it's like, this is a stressful life. It's not fun, as in it's not thrilling. Uh, it's very profitable. I make a lot of money, but I also work way more than I should. So when you uh, tally it down to an hourly wage, that number's not nearly as impressive. It's really not. Add in the risk, 
and uh, the, the stress, maybe I'm probably losing a few years of life. It's not that much money when you factor all that in. So in conclusion of that first point, if you're romanticizing the idea of a, of a card business, Pokemon card, magic card, whatever, be aware that it's not uh, this magical uh, unicorns crapping out rainbows, sparkle dust. It's it's not as thrilling as you think it would be. It's, I mean, I'm this entrepreneur that makes tons of money. I'm working from home. You know, it's like, it's not like these gurus say. Um, again, I'm not complaining. I'm very lucky. I love my, my job. But it's a job at the end of the day. It's a job and all these gurus on YouTube who flash their money and their rented, uh, their rented Lambos and their leased, uh, their rented planes. That's all fake, guys. If someone pulls up with a Rolly on their wrist driving a, a Lamborghini and they're like, ooh, yeah, I started this drop shipping. Like, none of that's real. It's just not. It's not real. And especially in this industry, that's not real. If you see someone flexing like that, it's all a facade. They're doing it for the clicks. They're doing it for their ego. If you want to know what real life running a business is, rewatch this video. It's waking up. It's uh, packaging orders alone, shipping them out, marketing, sending out emails, making Instagram videos. That's a, the, the most thrilling part of the day is uh, probably making the videos, and I hate editing, so that's half of making a video, just making a fun video, throwing it out there, and then hopefully getting clicks. That's fun, I guess. But the, it's, not, it's not like a thrilling job you need to romance. So if you have a 9 to 5 that you like, that you can stand, stick with that my advice. Um, this video was probably pretty disjointed. I think I was going to start off, I think I was going to cover like 10 different points. And we ended up covering basically, hey, is uh, is it fun to get into the Pokemon business? The answer is no, but it is worth it if you are the right type of personality, which I am and a few other people I know are. And uh, yeah, so if, if you have a certain personality, it's a, it's fantastic. You'll make a lot of money. You'll enjoy yourself. You don't have a boss to answer to. It's great. But just be aware there's risks and uh, stress and boredom for a lot of people. So we're going to conclude with that. This is a video about should you get into the Pokemon business, what it's actually like. Hopefully that was helpful. I love long form content. I love just listening to 30 minute videos in the background while I work. I don't listen to music while I'm packing orders anymore. I listen to like long form content like this. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it. And if you want to see more like this, you know, like, comment, subscribe, share, notification bell, do all the things. I'm trying to get uh, monetized. That'd be fun. Making money on YouTube. That'd be cool. So thank you guys so much. Again, my name is Brian at pokeyne.com. That's P-O-K-E-N-E, -E, short for Nebraska.com. Buy my stuff and have a wonderful day.